Welcome to Dementia Matters, a podcast presented by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our podcast is here to educate you on the latest research, caregiver strategies, and available resources for fighting back against Alzheimer's disease. I'm your host, Nathaniel Chin. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. William Schenkel. He specializes in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of patients with cognitive impairments due to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. He co-founded the Alzheimer's Research Center at the University of California in Irvine in 1987 and served as his clinical director for 10 years. Since establishing the Schenkel Clinic in 1997, Dr. Schenkel has seen more than 10,000 patients with dementia. I'm honored to have you here. Welcome, Dr. Schenkel. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. To begin, you have diagnosed and treated an extraordinary number of people with Alzheimer's disease or another cause of dementia, and this has been done over years and years. What have these experiences taught you about Alzheimer's disease that many people do not understand or realize about the disease? One thing about Alzheimer's disease is that people usually associate Alzheimer's disease with a severity called dementia, whereas uh, Alzheimer's disease is uh, an accumulation of certain molecules or proteins in the brain that uh, doesn't cause any symptoms for approximately 30 to 50 years. And the association between the term Alzheimer's disease and dementia leads to the fear of having it. And in general, people avoid finding out whether they have these proteins in the brain until they are so impaired that they can no longer uh, function on their own. If we um, treated Alzheimer's disease like diabetes or high blood pressure, where we routinely get a um, checkup for memory uh, after about 45 years old, Uh, we would be able to identify Alzheimer's disease while people are still functioning normally. So um, if if we, as as an educational group, could uh, educate doctors and the public that Alzheimer's disease is a preventable condition uh, in terms of preventing severities that people don't want, the memory loss, the dementia then they might be more prone to check their memory annually and detect it while they're still normal. So what you just said is very profound, and it's it's not in the traditional view, but I think a a part of that is because you're very particular about your use of the term Alzheimer's disease versus a syndrome or a condition like mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So do you believe that we can actually delay or prevent those syndromes of mild cognitive impairment and dementia? Um, So the answer is unequivocally yes. And for example, in genetically identical twins, uh, there are two national studies from Scandinavia where they looked at all genetically identical twins in the country, and they found that the age of onset for a pair of twins for Alzheimer's could differ by up to 15 years for about 13% of the entire population of identical twins who developed Alzheimer's. And I go, well, if they differed by 15 years in their age of onset, it certainly wasn't because of their genes. It had to be something else. And so we're learning a lot about lifestyle. You know, that lifestyle can, in fact, alter the, uh, the development of the symptoms it can alter the accumulation of the molecules of Alzheimer's disease. And we, I do want to talk to you about the risk factors that we need to address, but do you think we can prevent Alzheimer's disease, the disease process? The disease process. And I think that's a really good question. And, and I would say that what we, we can prevent um, the accumulation of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease we can prevent the accumulation of the misfolded proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease if we can reduce its rate of accumulation. There's a a very nice study by Montine 
um, uh, from Seattle, and they looked at a um, managed care population over 65 years old, and they randomly sampled people, and uh, they said, we'd like you to submit to a memory test every year, and then, you know, when you die, we'd like to take your brain and, and look at it. And so what they found, though, was that the people who were cognitively normal, the year they died, 98% of them had Alzheimer's in their brain. They had the disease in their brain, but they were cognitively normal. The difference between the cognitively normal group and the group that were demented was that the demented group had three times as much Alzheimer's disease in their brain. And that leads me to uh, believe that if we can reduce the rate of accumulation of these abnormal proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease enough, we can prevent reaching that threshold that produces symptoms. So we may have Alzheimer's disease in our brain, but we're functioning normally. So when I looked at the literature and asked the question, what things influence the rate of accumulation of the molecules of Alzheimer's? And it turns out that um, every chronic disease that's been studied increases the accumulation of these molecules if it's not well managed. Things like traumatic brain injury, general anesthesia, all of these things can influence how rapidly we accumulate these molecules. So that may explain how genetically identical twins can differ by 15 years in their age of onset. And that, to me, is, a, is an approach towards uh, preventing the symptoms. So I think that if we can detect people while they're functioning normally, uh, that we can eliminate the dementia almost certainly. And there's a pretty good chance we might be able to eliminate the memory loss with a combined approach of lifestyle supplements and the optimal, you know, medications. So then what do you think, going back to these risk factors, what do you think are the most important ones for a person to address? Hmm. Well, um, I, I divide them up into um, what your existing medical conditions are so that they're properly managed. And um, then we look at the level of physical exercise, and we look at the level of um, mentally stimulating activity. There's some nice studies that actually show that uh, lifelong engagement in uh, cognitively stimulating activities uh, is associated with much lower levels of beta amyloid. They showed in PET scans that people who engaged in regular kind of mentally stimulating activity like reading books or going to plays, theaters, uh, those things, um, they all uh, have a, a way of reducing the level of at least uh, amyloid in the brain. I think that the, the uh, cognitively uh, active group uh, they had levels of amyloid the same as 20-year-olds, whereas the cognitively uh, couch potato group had levels of amyloid the same as people who were demented with Alzheimer's in that study. So, yeah, I think there's the, there's uh, uh, the cognitive stimulation, the, the physical activity, the lifestyle. Uh, I, I believe your center here is um, uh, world-renowned for uh, looking at diet, at um, issues of fasting that uh, also influence the rate of accumulation. So I think that all of those things can add up to uh, delay that rate of accumulation so you don't cross the threshold. I believe a part of our job as physicians is to motivate people to make these healthy lifestyle changes, but that's not an easy task. Do you find people are more motivated to address these chronic conditions because of the concern for mild cognitive impairment or dementia? Yeah, so the, uh, that's a good question. Uh, usually, if, if you ask people who come to a talk or listen to a podcast um, before they've listened to the podcast, would you be willing to check your memory to see if you might have a, a problem? And they say, no, I don't want to find out. Uh, and about 90% of people, what we found is that after hearing that 90% of what we find is treatable, 
maybe not curable, but treatable, so that we can make your, your life a whole lot better just by checking your memory, okay? Uh, most of them say, well, yeah, I want to take the test. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a behavioral shift that happens once they know there's something they can do about it and that it makes a big difference to them. Yeah, they makes, it makes a lot of sense to them. Well, then on the other side of this, how do you approach people whom you've diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or dementia? So when I see a person uh, with the symptoms of either Alzheimer's or some other cause of mild cognitive impairment or dementia, I try to actually be very pragmatic. And I say, okay, this is what is causing this memory difficulty. And we know, we know that these molecules are in the brain, and we have things that will block further accumulation. We have things that will reduce the amount of those molecules. And we know from previous work that this will not only improve your cognition for at least two or three years, but by at a very minimum, delay the progression by 50 to 60 percent. And when you combine a lot of things like lifestyle and supplements and medication, uh, we typically see about a 100 to 200 percent delay compared to the untreated course. So this means there's a very good chance that we can either eliminate the dementia if you have mild cognitive impairment or greatly reduce it so you will not be dependent upon others in the things that you've done all your life. Well, with that, you know, I'd really like to thank you for being on Dementia Matters, and I hope to have you on the next time you visit Madison. I'd be delighted, and thank you very much. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.